Probably being recorded. Cool. Okay. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the Barcelona Office of Software Meetup. We are a meetup that have a very nice t shirt. Uh, we do have uh, things in Twitter, Mastodon, and a meetup, right? So, uh, like and subscribe and follow and all those things that people do. Uh, so, yeah, we have very nice t shirts, as I said. If you all want a nice t-shirt, you can donate me money and I will donate you a t-shirt. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, nothing else. Uh, we do things every month, kind of, more or less. We will not be doing things over the summer because it's too hot uh, and people don't like going to places. So probably this will be the last one until September or something. Anyhow, if you want something to talk, come and talk to me or the other people in red only pablo has read today but yeah or muriel or albert and we will try to schedule a talk for you we do things free software and friends free culture free hardware and whatnot and thanks to Alvinta for hosting us here uh, they're great so Juan Fran is gonna speak about Alvinta now okay okay thank you very much well, uh, I'm Juan Fra Fernandez. I am a machine learning engineer here in Adevinta, and I welcome all of you to our premises to, that are today are hosting the meeting. And let me introduce a little bit our company. So, Adevinta is an international company. We are right now in 11 countries, mainly in Europe, but we have presence as well in, in America. Uh, and we are um, um, a company that does classified boards, boards of classified ad advertisements, and we operate mainly in uh, three verticals, which are real estate, uh, mobility, uh, generalist, which means that could have real estate or mobility, but not dedicated, not with the same services. And we have something that is called uh, emerging verticals that uh, have jobs, job boards. Okay, uh, and then let me show you a little video that is very explanative. Do you hear the video? No? Oh, yeah, this, this, this happens with live. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's try it again. No, it's not delivering. No worries. It it has captions, so you can just read the captions, and, and I don't want to waste your time because the main dish is uh, after that. in the online classified space. Our leading brands are reimagining <laughs> policy today. But this was a great idea. To make more sustainable choices by helping everything and everyone find a new purpose. Be it so hard to find kids or that awesome deal. We are there at every meaningful moment in your life. And while our hearts beat for local markets, our impact goes beyond borders. With every second-hand trade, we are shaping Europe and the world towards inclusive societies, a healthier environment, and thriving economies. Championing for sustainable commerce. We are Adavinta, changing commerce together. So just keep in mind two ideas. We are a sustainable company. We try to recycle uh, everything by just commercing with two second-hand goods. And uh, if you have something to sell, it would be a, a house, it would be anything like a car or whatever, you can go to any of the portals of Adevinta. And without more ado, any ado, uh, let's go for Jean-Baptiste Kempf. Let's uh, develop it in VLC that will tell us how we was the, their journey in the VLC product, Jean-Baptiste. All for you. So now it's not going to work, of course, because else it will be too, too, too fun.
You see, it works. Okay. Probably because I'm using a software, I don't know if you know about that. It's called KDE, it works quite well. Um, hi, um, so I'm very happy to be in here in Barcelona. I love that city. I'm not often here, and maybe with the weather, I should be more. Um, it's quite funny to, to, to be in Adevin Tarit because I've been using Le Bon Coin for years, right? And, um, <laughs> and well, Le Bon Coin is. Uh, where there is the best of France and the worst. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to talk, talk about Vidolan. Um, I'm not a teacher, so stop me, right? Ask me questions, right? Um, Vidolan is, um, is a bit different from the normal open source uh, organization, um, mostly because, well, we are not as well behaved as the others. Um, and there is a lot of reason for that, right? Um, but let's see about why. Um, so my name is Jean-Baptiste. Uh, everyone called me JB, right? So don't worry, it's impossible to to to, to say that name. Um, I've been working on VLC for now 18 years, 19 years. Um, and the story of VLC is a, a stupid and insane one. Um, and the goal of VideoLine is that you have cones and everywhere. And when you see a cone, you think, hey, software, right? Not Graphic roads. Um, that makes no sense. Um, but that's one of the stupidities that we're doing. Um, okay, so the story starts at the Ecole Centrale Paris, which is one of those weird elite engineering schools in France, right? This completely weird system that you'd only see in Korea. Um, but anyway, those how how we 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 have the best engineers in France. And the Ecole Centrale Paris is a, 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 a university that depends on the, um, the Ministry of Education. Right? Most of the other elite schools are uh, Ministry of Industry or Army or something. like This one is from the education, and so it's a poor university. So the story starts in the 1960s in France. They have a very nice campus near uh, Gare de Lyon, so downtown Paris, and so they can have only 100 students per year. Right? Um, and so they decided, because it was called Ecole Centrale Paris, to move to somewhere they had more space and that it was cheap, so they decided to move to Clermont-Ferrand, right? You probably don't know where it is, right? It's the middle of it's in Paris. Uh, most French people wouldn't know where it would be, right? It's like literally in the middle of nowhere, right? And there is nothing there, right? So. Um, it's like something like you go take Madrid, you go 55, 100 kilometers north, right, where there is nothing, right, that, that place, right, um, around that, right. Um, and so the old, the old the alumni says, okay, no go, we cannot do that, right. Um, and, and because they have no money, they decide to buy this piece of land south of Paris, um, which is near uh, Parc de Sceaux, which is like a big park, right. Don't worry, I'm going to speak about VLC, right? But that's the reason why we have VLC, right? So, um, and, and so you have arrived at this very weird case where the it's a university, public university, uh, managed by the Ministry of Education, right? So like most public school you can get, um, built on a private land, right? And the private land is owned by the alumni, the non-profit of the alumni, but still it's not public, right? Um, and, and the consequence of that is that everything on the campus is managed by the students, like phones, television, food, drinks, um, but also like room management. Well, everything is owned and managed by the students. And, 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 and this is in the eighties, they start a, a non-profit, a, a small association, which is called Vivre l'informatique autrement. Completely stupid, but it was basically IBM who wanted to have somewhere to play and to have a laboratory. And so they deploy 1,500 token ring. Um, do, do you know what token ring is? None, right? So you knew, okay. Um, okay. So they do a very large network at 10 megabits per second in the 80s. And, and token ring is, a uh, um, a network technology in a ring, 
and not with routers, right? So instead of everyone talking to a router and have an IP address, what you do is that you talk to your neighbor, like when you hold hands and you press it, and you you send the, the network packet and then you send it to the next one, which sends to the next one and on. The good thing is very cheap, right? Because you don't need routers, you don't need anything. The problem is that it's slow, right? Because it's as slow as the slowest computer on it, right? Um, and if one of the computer is slow, it's going to read the packet, say, mm, is it for me? Mm, no. Right? And then you go on, right? So in the 80s, it's okay, right? We you use Pine and, and MUT. Um, not, maybe not even MUT, right? You tell net to, to, to somewhere and you, you send uh, a mail. Um, but it's not good enough in the early 90s where we start to have Zoom and you want to play in network, right? And of course, the students arrive and say, well, you know, our software, we need, we need a faster network for work, right? The web is here, right? And and the, and the university understands why it's for to play video games, right? Um, and they answer in the most hypocritical French way, which is, guys, we would love to help you. Right? There is a letter. We would love to help you. But as you understand, this is a private piece of land. We cannot help you. So please go and see the partners of the university, meaning corporate sponsors, right? Which was a way to say, Fuck you. Um, but polite, right? And the students are stupid, right? And, and, and stubborn. So that's exactly what they do, right? So they go and see IBM, 3Com. Um, they go and see Big Telecom, Big, which was like this concrete manufacturer in France, right? Who's building half of the building of France. Um, and of course, who built the, the campus. And one of the guys says, okay, I understand nothing about that. But, you know, we're working with TF1 and TPS, right? So televisions and the future of video is satellite well it's not uh but in 1995 well that was a good bet right and say if you can instead of putting 1500 satellite dish and decoders right those were big satellite dish and the decoders were and costed some around 2000 francs at that time it was like millions to to get there right so do that and put only one dish here on the on the B building and then send that everywhere right so we are talking about 1994 right the computer uh, for 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 86 dx at 33 megahertz or 66 megahertz um having uh, video decoding real time on those machines was science fiction but well, say okay sure we'll do that and so they start the project uh in 1996 and the project was called network 2000 yeah of course right uh, and <laughs> And basically, well, they managed to do it, right? Um, um, after 1996-1997, there was a demo of 40 seconds, right? Because at 45 seconds, everything was crashing. The machine was with a huge amount of 64 megabytes of RAM, which was needed because, of course, the software was leaking. Uh, but yeah, they had a, a, an ATM network at 155 megabits per second, probably one of the fastest in, in the world at that time. Um, top notch, of course, the connection to internet was one megabit per second, but we don't say that. Um, and the project could have stopped there. But, um, and of course, it was working on Linux and on Linux and on Linux, basically. Um, some of them, um, and, and the project could have stopped here, but some of the new students arrived, because every year it was a student project, and say, okay, I want to video on a network, video on a local network, video LAN, amazing name, better than Network 2000, right? Um, manage to say, well, oh, maybe other people care about that, and we want that to be open source, right? Because, of course, the best guys are doing open source. A few were. In order to get the project to do, they had to compile the Linux kernel and modify things to get support for multicast and so on. So, and of course, the, the university said, "Ah, you know what? Um, we own your IP because when you sign the contract as a student, right, you say that basically the you give all your copyright to the school, right? So, starts a two years, two years and a half fight um, between the call and the students to relicense that as GPL." And so, uh, in 2001, VideoLAN becomes GPL. Of course, that means nothing, because nothing was called VideoLAN, but, well, it's good enough. Um, the project at the time had servers, clients, 
And of course, a lot of networking technology that is dead. But one of the things that they did was to do multicast on a non-multicast network. Yeah. Basically, the, the software, so if you wanted to wa watch the television, you had to go, it was broadcasting on different VLANs. And so the software was calling a central point, which was changing your your IP, your your plug to a different VLAN. And of course, if your software like VLC crashed, well, no internet for you anymore because you're on the wrong VLAN. Anyway, <laughs> so um, this became VideoLAN, right? And 2000, since 2001, it's an open source project and there's a lot of software. One of them is VLC, probably the most known, but it's also X264, the encoder, which is probably the most used video encoder in the world, everything you see on YouTube, Facebook, Netflix, and so on, it's based on that. But we have a ton of other libraries called DVD, decryption, Blu-ray decryption. Um, so it's a bit like KDE or GNOME, except we are smaller and we have less projects, but that's the idea, right? It's really a, a, a number of organization. VLC is the most known, um, and as you understand, it came from video LAN client, and then we dropped it because it's also a server now. Um, uh, and De facto, we are the core of the open source multimedia community, right? We're doing hosting for FFmpeg. We're doing, we're giving money to LibEV Codec, to OBS. Um, we organize most of the open source uh, video event, and also we work on standards, mostly free, free software and free, free, um, uh, free standards like AV1. Yeah. Um, when I'm in the middle of nowhere in India or in Africa, right, and I speak about VLC, like a lot of them don't even know what VLC, but when I say the fucking cone that plays video, yeah, they know that. And of course, they call Central Paris, like no one cares, right? No one knows. Um, why drunk students play with cone on the campus, of course? Um, and also, like, someone did it in the software and then you couldn't remove it, right? Because when it's in, never gets out. And today it's a very, very, very strong brand, right? People know about VLC, people know about the cone that plays video, right? So it's, at some point we had the icon redesign and um, we're talking about around 1 million downloads per day, around 500 million active users. So, as I said, it's probably the most used French software and the least profitable. Well, zero divided by 500 million, right? That, how much is that, right? Um, on our website, we have around 5.3 billion downloads, right? And so it, it's difficult to, to know exactly the user page because we don't do, what do they call it? Telemetry, which I call spying. Um, so we need to estimate it, right? And a lot of people are distributing outside. Um, and yeah. <laughs> During COVID, we knew that on Windows there were two billions of minutes uh, of uh, two billions. How is it? Two billions of minutes of usage of VLC on Windows 10 today. Whatever that means. Um, and of course, on on Linux, right? It's very difficult to know how many how many people are actually running Linux worldwide. You is it? I mean, how many people are running Linux worldwide? 100 million? 200 million? Hmm. Anyway, um, it's popular because it's playing absolutely everything, right? Uh, and you have to understand that at the beginning, it wasn't designed to, that's yet another weird thing about VLC, right? No one said, oh, I'm going to do a better video player and I'm going to put all the codecs in it, right? It was just like, oh, now that I put it, it on Windows, how do I ship all the packages that I depend from Linux? Where is my Windows packager? And then they realized that there wasn't, right? So they decided to package all the codecs because that was the easiest because most of them were Linux developers and had no clue about registry and so on, right? But this proved to be exactly what people needed, right? Like not having to download something that doesn't work. And so every VLC plays everything. And also because we don't really care about licensing of patents and stuff like that. We decrypt DVDs, we decrypt Blu-rays, we ship. Like if I had to pay for all the stuff, the, all the license of all the codecs and the patents, I would need to pay maybe 100 or 200 euros per 
user, but I don't know who my users are, right? Because I'm not tracking them. Um, and at the time, we had people who had downloaded DivX and, and other stuff on DC or Emule or Kaza or BitTorrent, things that, of course, none of you ever done because that's completely illegal and you shouldn't do that. Um, but yeah. Um, and also, it work, runs everywhere. The last version of VLC in the NALAS release still works on Windows XP uh, up to Windows 11, but it still runs on OS2, which means that the five users of OS2 are very happy, right? Um, of course, all types of Linux, BOS, um, um, BSDs, and of course, Android, iOS, uh, even on the web, right? We have a VLC version only on web. Um, that's a, a very old slide, um, but that gives you the idea of what VideoLand was. And, and you see that after years, it's still the same, right? You can use VLC to take any type of video cards, satellites, text things, transcode, and stream that. And that's to realize where VLC is not just a player, it's also a streamer, it's also a real-time encoder, it's basically a multimeter framework. So, old versions of VLC. Um, you see it's still written video on the client. This is probably on a GNOME 2, or even b before, probably. Um, and of course, it's a, it's a James Bond movie. Um, the reasons we used a lot is that the, when they added the support of VLC DVD playback, they had a GoldenEye DVD, that's the only DVD they had, and that's why all the numbers of uh, VideoLand were named after James Bond. Okay, well, that's very old. UI, um, but the first versions where it was able to play directly the TV. Um, first version on macOS, uh, that's the version that was the most known uh, with WX widgets, which is a, a widget library. Don't ever use that ever if you can, um, unless you like pain, which, okay, then do it. Um, versions of macOS, and then, of course, the version that is the best using Qt, running on Dome 3, that plays ponies. Um, so, most of the development of VLC was done by volunteers. A lot of them were students at the Ecole Centrale Paris, and then moved away. Um, but still, like, it's quite important to remind that uh, only volunteers, or mostly volunteers. On the Cathedral and Bazaar, we are mostly on the Bazaar side, like, really Bazaar. Uh, more than other nonprofits like KDE and GNOME, which are quite organized. Um, and one of the reasons that like, a lot of us have been doing reverse engineering of codecs, reverse engineering of DVD protocols, and so on. So, yeah, we are not very well behaved. Um, today, the Videoland nonprofit is around 30 people, and then you have a lot of FFmpeg, X264 people joining. So the nonprofit is quite poor. We have 30 members. Uh, membership is free, but you need to be accepted, which is difficult to get uh, accepted. Um, I created that in 2008. Um, it mostly has money to buy hardware. We need a lot of hardware for video, lots of graphic cards that we buy and then don't do anything with it. A lot of phones. Um, and then, of course, Havel servers, legal. Um, for a long time, we've been using IRC, right? So that's Slack for old people, um, and mailing list. Um, we had a lot of things on Track, PHP, BBD, MediaWiki, and so on. We moved everything to GitLab. Um, we have, of course, our own GitLab, because we don't trust anyone else in us. And all the software we're using is open source, and, and everything that we deploy is open source. Um, I think this is pretty standard, but... And we had a very early code of conduct before it was a fashion to have it. So if you look at our code of conduct, it's very simple. You'll see code, code contributors are around five to 10 people, right? It's always very, very small. Um, over the lifetime of VLC, we're talking about more than 1,000. Every year we have around 150 contributors. Um, and, and the decisions on VLC is mostly done on the quality of code. Um, and that's why you sometimes don't understand why some basic features are not in VLC and some completely stupid ones are in. It's just because technically, like statistically, no one contributes and stays, right? 
you have 1,000 people, 10 are left, right? Statistically, if you send me patches, you're going to go away, right? Because you're going to change job, you're going to change spouse, you're going to have an accident, you're going to, I don't know, be 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 aqua hired by Meta or Facebook and so on, right? We have no marketing, almost no legal. Um, the people who have the code get more votes when we have to take decisions, basically. Um, and so far, um, we never had any folks. So why is VLC popular, right? That's a good question, right? So it's not just by luck. It's also about some decisions, which maybe are, were not done for the right reasons, but were done, right? One of them is to ship all the codecs on macOS and Windows because those were Linux developers. But there are a few things that are quite interesting. The first one is that we're using modules. Um, the second one is that we're using C minus uh, minus, and then with that we are network oriented. So let me explain all that. The architecture of VLC is um, quite simple, right? It's because it's very light. It's around eighty thousand lines of C, right? One hundred thousand lines of C. It's not big, right? Um, and what it does is basically doing abstraction across different um, type of uh, operating systems, has managed memory, networking and threads, and loading modules. And then it does the basic thing, which is audio video synchronization. But that's the only thing that does, right? Doesn't have no UI, no codecs, no nothing. And above that, there is a binding called libvlc, which is a simpler API and which is stable. So because of that, Everything that you implement is a module, right? And that's really good, right? Because you want to new, add a new feature, you touch a module. You want to have a new um, decode, decoder, you add a module. You want to port VLC to a new platform, you're just going to do an audio output, a video output, and a UI, right? So the other way to do the other way to do that is to take the, the library that does it on all platforms. And then you have OpenGL and SDL, and then you have pain for the rest of your life. Um, so, and the reasons why VLC people did modules was absolutely not because of that reason. The reason is that it was faster to compile because they had slow machines. And so they compiled everything on modules, right? But that caused some very simple API for all the modules because there is basically three functions, open, close, and describe, and that's it. Um, but that managed to get a, a, a very simple way to add features. Also, most of the module are cross-platform, and some of them are on-platform. So we have lots of people who arrive and say, hey, I'm porting VLC to OS2. Sure. And so the port of OS2, I don't care. It doesn't break, because it's just a few modules. That was a good decision. Again, not because they thought about it, but because they were lucky. Um, yeah, C, right? Um, the product refused to use C++ for a long time. Um, so we are doing a type of inheritance in C, right? So pointer to functions or pointer to functions and pointer to functions. This is actually very good, right? Because um, today that's less a problem, but in the past, like C++ support was a pain on many platforms where, where we ported things. But also it forces to have a very simple language. Um, C is a pain, um, it will always be a pain, but it's a simple pain. When, as soon as you move to C++, then you have multiple planes and you need to find the right subversion of the C++ standard that you all agree on, which you don't. Um, so um, there is some, we have some common members, common objects, and then we do simple inheritance like that. You pass the object, and then the core gives you an object. You modify a few things, and you give it back. The problem of that is that you need to really understand threads, and by experience, most people don't. Um, and the third reason why it's uh, it became quite popular is this network-oriented graph, right? So protocols would be HTTP, file, FTP, right? So you put a new URL here. And then you have a stream of data here, and then you have a format which is MKV, MP4, AVI. Then it splits with video, audio, subtitles, metadata, and then you go the subtitle gets render and text. The video is filtered and then displayed. 
and the audio same is displayed, and then you have your ear that is somewhere here, and your eyes that is somewhere here. Right? The thing is, if you look at this graph, there is something weird. Right? If you look at the left part of, you see those two arrows? They go in the wrong direction, right? Um, VLC, a contrario from most video player and mo even more, most things like YouTube, is that VLC is going to eat only what is required by the format, right? So when you give a buffer in VLC, you don't give it by saying, I want five megabytes or something like that. Um, you give a constant timing, right? You'd say a caching of 300 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds or one second. And basically, VLC is going to pull the data from the protocol only that it needs to play the file, right? Um, this, and if you remember when you go on YouTube, you see, even if you don't watch it, right? This never happens with VLC because it's only going to consume what it needs. Um, but because of that, VLC is very resilient to incomplete files because it's it considers normal to not have access to the whole file. It considers normal to not have access and not being able to seek in the file because maybe you're on a UDP protocol. And this is the reason why VLC can play completely broken files because you say, hey, it doesn't work. Let's try anyway. And that's, for example, very good when you're downloading for 24 hours a file over donkey um, and you want to be sure that the Disney movie is an actual Disney movie and not an adult file. When you're watching an adult file, you're not watching downloading a rugby match or whatever, right? And and the thing is, very quickly after a few megabytes, right, VLC is able to not watch, but give you some information, right? Oh yeah, I'm able to watch it, and that's pretty cool. And that's one of the reasons why VLC was popular. So I'm going to show you stupid uh, features which makes no sense. Uh, that we have in VLC, but that all of those have a very, very low maintenance, right? We have a VNC support, right? We have audio, we have video, you have clicks, because you need to be able to click on DVD menus, right? So, hey, this is VNC. Works also with remote desktop. You can do mosaic. Um, basically, this is one VLC decoding 20 video resizing them, putting them together, and streaming out, right? VLC is not a player, right? It's a multimedia framework like GStreamer or Upipe or Lyric Show. Since 2003, we have a wall display, right? So a lot of places where you see like big walls of TVs, often it's a VLC running it, right? On, on each of the machine, there is a VLC actually decoding the whole file, but just displaying some part of it. Um, we support karaoke and MIDI. Why not, right? Um, it's popular in Asia, but we have this, um, which is a puzzle, puzzle filter in VLC, right? So um, once when you're watching a, a French movie and you're bored, right, because it's a French movie, um, you can activate the puzzle and then you can drag the pieces around, right? And you've never seen it? Right, uh, maybe I can show it. Do I find I can show you? Hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's boring. It's for so. Okay. Thank you. 
be do effects and uh, advance. <coughs> So and then, of course, I can go there, and you know, I can grab. <laughs> this is around, right? And <laughs> and actually, that that actually works, right? And yeah, yeah, okay. You see, there is a small part above everywhere at, at the bottom, so that you can see it, right? Um. So this looked stupid, right? Um, and, and that's as stupid as, as you can guess. But the guys who did that was a, a teacher, a math teacher, who wanted to explain Bayer's curves to his students, right? And, and actually coded that a long time ago. And the code is quite clean. It works pretty well. It's very efficient in VLC. Um, yeah, I merged it and I was just like, yeah, no one cares. Um, until one day, there is a mail that receives and says, the title was, Puzzle too simple. <laughs> I was just like, so, and the mail is like that. Yeah, um, JB, yeah, it's a bit a weird question and so on, but um, I, I love the puzzles filter and it's uh, only 16 by 16 and that's only 256 um, thing. And, and during a movie, right, it's too easy, right? And, and, and I finished too early, right? And I'm just like, um, could you, do you think that you could <laughs> increase that number? And actually, the, the 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 change was like, it's in the cute UI, right? It's not actually in the filter that there is it. And so I, of course, changed that, right? And and added that. And it was just like, no way, right? And the thing is, when you have that many number of users, even a stupid filter that no one uses, there are people who are actually using that. Um, and yeah, I don't. Uh, <laughs> we have a version, of course, that is without UI. Right, well, which is useful for 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 geeks, right? Uh, but still, you have you have the video that is not there, right? So what happens when you don't have an X11 client? Well, of course, we have an output which is uh, using libkaka, which is also something done by, of course, one of the VLC guy, um, and which is using ASCII arts, right? Not even Unicode um, to display. It's very used. Right, and one of the best use case of that is that you have a multicast network. You don't know when the video is not working where it is, right? So you SSH to all the routers, and then you're just going to watch whether you have video or not. And that's useful, right? Because you're not going to run X11 or Wayland if anyone is actually using that in real life. Uh, sorry. Um, first version of VLC on Android, right? Quite ugly. Um, this is the current version of Android. And now we have a version running even on Android TVs. Um, we had the first version on iOS using this very ugly, very iOS, early iOS style. Uh, the current one is a bit more classic. We have a version that runs on watchOS. It means your battery in half an hour. Um, <laughs> Of course, it's not on the store because Apple, Apple dictatorship doesn't allow us to do that. But still, it's cool. Um, versions on Apple TV. We had versions for VR when VR was all the rage, uh, which was five years ago. Um, it's going to be full, full VR soon again, right? Because Apple is arriving with their stupid Apple Vision Pro. Um, that was a version we had for the, the which is a bit different from the, the Windows version, which was a, what was it called? Win, Metro, Windows Metro, Windows RT, or whatever that was, that's dead. Um, and of course, we had a version for Tizen, for phones, which is also dead. Okay, um, this one is an interesting thing that we added in VLC3, which is uh, complex tech support, right? So. As all of you correctly read at the bottom, this is Japanese and Korean, right? Um, but it's interesting because this is a story starts like that. Someone arrives and says, Same JV, um, my name is Salahadin Salah. I am in East Aleppo. I go on Le Monde, there is like bombing, bombing, bombing. Okay, sure. I have two hours of electricity and two hours of uh, internet per day. Um, but I have nothing to do. 
can you give me a task on VLC? Do you know C? Just like, no, I will learn. Sure. So I asked him, you know what? Do you know Arabic? Can you can you check Arabic, right? Because Arab Arabic support was horrible and weirdly rendering text is insanely complex, right? Um so Arabic. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. And Arabic is horrible because you need to write from left to right and then right to left for the numbers and then it is very difficult. Um, and of course, you have all those ligatures which change the shape and so on, right? Very difficult. So the guys, and the guy say, okay, and leaves. And then after, I don't know, three months, I receive a patch. The patch is horrible, I explained to him. And after four months, well, it's merged. Right? The guys come back and say, hey, can you help me? I need to do something else. Just like, uh, yeah, I've got an, uh, yeah, got an Hebrew issue, right? And I was just like, JB, are you insane? You're asking from someone who's in Aleppo, in Syria, getting bombed, um, and asking him to support Hebrew, right? Like, are you? And the guy said, yeah, sure. Leaves, come back. Right? I'm just like, oh, I'm bored, and I'm still on the wall. What can I do? I'm just like, yeah, I need support for what we call complex text layout, which is that, right? And that you all have recognized as my Malayalam, um, which is, of course, uh, an East Southeast India uh, language. Um, very complex, right? A lot of very complex ligature that you can see here, right? Those are. Um, and for that to render, you need not only free type and free BD, like Arabic, but then you need something like half buzz, which is something that is not documented. And because, of course, most of the fonts don't have the right glyphs, you need to support font config and so on. That's a nightmare. Guy leaves and, and does that. Amazing. We got merge. I ask, like, Salah, what do you want, right? Do you want, I don't know, like, you want to come to France? Do you want to? And the guy says, Can I have a video LAN email and a recommendation letter? Insane. Um, so, to give you an idea, a generic VLC release is around 20,000 commits. It's always a bit long to come. Um, the the, the 3.0 was important because it was a focus on mobile and desktop, um, which was doing a lot of support and supporting Wayland. Um, the next generation is called Auto Trick because after GoldenEye and James Bond, we moved to, of course, um, this word names. Um, it's one of the major version, and we're dropping a lot of things. We've of course did too many things, so we are, have a lot of issues. Um, actually finishing things a bit like KDE4. Um, but yeah, that looks like that currently. Right? It's a bit different from what we've done in the past. Um, this is a media library. Well, it's going to change soon, but it is what we designed at the beginning. So it's still active. Okay. Um, so let's talk about other things, right? Um, then we are seeing there is a, this old video codec called AV1, which was like. Uh, an answer to um, to HVC um, and VVC, right? So multimedia is a patent field, right? There is patents everywhere. Anything you do, there is a patent, right? It's the most patented field in all NEC technologies with 5G, basically. Um, and so Google and Facebook and so on decided to do a new codec, and that was called AV1. Um, was mostly Google and Cisco and Mozilla doing it. It's pretty cool. But the thing is, we felt that it was very, going to be very difficult to merge um, and to have support of that, right? Because people are using H.264, it works fine. So how do you make things, right? And of course, because Google was Google, they say, ah, what we've done is great, and we, everyone will follow. Yeah, no, no one did. Um, so I said that we need a very good, a very, very good uh, AV1 decoder in software. So we wrote this piece of code called David, um, and David is, well, David is an AV1 decoder, that's an acronym. Um, it's interesting because it's around 30,000 lines of C, easy, right? Uh, but around 240,000 lines of handwritten assembly. That's probably one of the largest software in the world. I, I don't know anyone that insane to do that, except us. Uh, there is more Handwritten assembly in David and the rest on FFmpeg. Um, and of course, it's using Chrome, Firefox, Windows. It's now the default AV1 decoder on Android. It's on being used by Netflix, VLC, FFmpeg, and so on. 
Um, and, and you can see that the people who wrote AV1 are doing the blue ones, and this is what we have, right? So we are around five times faster than what they did. Um, yeah, it's pretty insane. Pretty fun. Um, yes, writing assembly by hand is fun. We are working on other things, right? One of the things we're working on is called VLC.wasm. So we compile all VLC, the million lines of code of C, plus all the dependencies in WebAssembly, and we run that inside the web browser so that you can play any type of file without transcoding them directly in the web browser. Works pretty well. Um, we have a lot of security issue in VLC because we're parsing C files by, but we're parsing media files by hand in C, right? So it's crashing all the time. So we're working on doing a sandbox around VLC. Um, it's difficult to do, uh, mostly because um, the sandbox, everyone is using the Chrome sandbox. The Chrome sandbox is huge, around 200,000 lines of code. So we, we don't want to import all that. But mostly is that we need a sandbox that is able to output gigabits per second, right? Not five megabyte page, right? And we need to be real time for everything we're doing. So that's pretty difficult, um, especially because we want that to be cross platform. Um, but yeah, that's basically the research project we're working on. And I think I've spoken too much. So any questions? Don't be shy. Uh, where do you get your funding? Like, I know that you don't have a lot of funding. You have no money. Zero money. Zero. Okay. Nada. Nada. Uh, Videolan is only being receiving money through donations on our website. Because if you go on our website, you can see. Right, you can donate four euros or five dollars here, and you go to PayPal. Right, that's it. This is the only way we get money. Right, so that's not much money, but also we don't have. We wouldn't get any money, right? The, any video engineer costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, right? So we have jobs, and one of the jobs is I, I created a few companies around VLC. But they are a consulting company, basically. Uh, how do you manage? Because you said there are patents and royalties. How do you manage to avoid being sued by? Okay, let's let's play a game. You're a lawyer, right? Okay. You're now a patent lawyer. Okay. Talk to me. I want money. Je suis désolé, je ne parle pas anglais. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'expliquer en français? La technique cuts 80%. Go. Then, you, then you're going to tell me, no, JP, I've seen you speak English, right? Or as you in French, but yeah, uh, you, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you show me your patent? Sure. Well, no, that's just at least ten percent of the pat of the patent, ten extra percent. They say, "Oh, you need mad money." I'm just saying, money for what? Show me your patent. Ten percent again, leave right. So just with those two techniques, you move from you cut ninety percent, right? And then I start looking at the patent and just like, hmm. you know that we implemented in VLC before your patent. Do you still want to discuss, or do you want us to say that publicly that your patent is void? Usually, we never hear about them anymore. Um, most of the patents are bogus. That's the thing, right? Most of the patents, not all of them are bogus, right? But most of them have no idea what they're saying. And it's like just like, oh, I have 10,000 patents. Well, I have 20,000. OK, he's pay, right? Uh, most of them make no sense. Uh, and all of them. Well, so the problem is also that we have no money, right? So if try to attack me, right? And you manage to it, I'm just like, oh yeah, we have 
30,000 euros on our bank account. Do you still want to attack us? Do you want to handle the PR about attacking VLC to gain what? And most of the time, I know better the patents than the people who wrote it. But... Are we always trolling? Yes. When's uh, VLC4 coming out? When it's ready? No idea. Is it ever going to be ready? Is it... <laughs> We, we did a few mistakes, um, and that was also because I, at some point of my life I was a bit too busy outside of VLC, but we did too many things, and we modified the core, at the same time we moved to QML, and that was not a good idea, right? If I had to do it, I wouldn't move to QML, um, it's a very bad tech, um, not finished, and that's quite complex. You get there. Probably at the end of this year we'll have something a bit more strong, but I'm very annoying, right? So until I'm happy, no release. Um, you you said everything is a module. Um, has it happened that you have to change the interface between, uh, you know, the core and the modules, and then someone has to port everything to the new interface, and it's a lot of work, and you maybe prefer killing modules than porting them or something like this. Does it happen? No, it never happened right? because you're going. Uh, I need to find the right place, but it was moved lately. But there is like three functions, like really three functions, right? It's with a VLC object in close, and you pass an in the VLC object when you open. Oh, maybe I can show you it's easier in the other direction. So when you write a VLC module, right? Um, you declare the open function and the the close function, right? Here you just, well, it doesn't have even a, a close version, right? So you, you say, oh, this is a module. You give the input type, right? So the category of the module, you give a name. The capability, which is basically the, is it a very important module? Because when you're going to open you're going to open all the module of this category, and then you're going to um, set the callbacks, right? And sometimes you don't even losing callback, right? Because you don't need that. So let's go and see what is in the open decoder. So the function here basically takes the, the object that is giving to the core, it casts it as a decoder because it knows that it's a decoder. It basically checks that the codec is PNG, right? If it's not, it tells you no, and the probe functions, it's a probe function, right? Then you allocate, you malloc this, the, the context, you set a few things, and then you write EFD code on the VLC object, right? And that's the only thing you do, right? So you have an open function, a closed function, and in the context that is giving you by the VLC object that you're casting static cast, right? Because you know that you're a decoder, you're going to add, well, EFD code. And so when you close that function with a success, then the core knows that there is PDEC EFD code and it's going to call the code. Right? So 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 you the, could you could argue that that's part of the interface. So. Yeah, but how, how many times would you change that, right? Maybe, uh, maybe right. not for a for a video codec, but for the UI. You said the UI is also uh, 
same for the UI, right? The, the, the interface between the core and the UI is almost small, right? Because you're just going to say, launch UI. So the, the interface between the core, right? And so the way you, from the UI, call the core, this one is where you're using libvlc core, so the, 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 not to launch the module, but to call back the core, this API changes all the time. And that's what we call libvlc core, and it's, And so that's what libvlc core is. So every, even every small version, we break that API, right? So third party applications, which use libvlc, don't link to libvlc core, they link to libvlc, right? So the interface to load the module and call the module is very simple. We don't change it, but the way to call back the core is very, diff very complex. Well, complex ish. Any other question? If, if there is no more questions, I have one question. Uh -huh. um, do you do things with video and codecs, and do you have code that leverages the possibility to be to have a, C, a GPU inside the machine that is uh, running VLC? Yes. Now, I've, most of the codecs are hardware accelerated. Lots of uh, video filter are hardware accelerated, and now we have some AI in VLC um, modules. So, yeah, GPUs are quite important. And when you're on a phone, right, like you need everything on the GPU. There is no other way. Well, thank you. Last question. Sure. 